So jujitsu has only been around for essentially my, my grandfather's lifetime. You know, Brazilian jujitsu, Gracie jujitsu, right? has only been around since my grand my grandfather's lifetime. The second generation, my you know, my uncles, my aunts, uh, some of my older cousins. When you compare the the one and a half lifetimes of jujitsu versus kung fu or karate or you know these wrestling, and they've been around for hundreds of years, jujitsu is still very much you know, in its teenage years. And, and I think you are right. I think, you know, our kids um, will look back at us and say that we're old school. They'll have a deeper understanding of jiu-jitsu than we do by far. And that's something that I try to tell my students. Jiu-jitsu is young and, and it's essentially an ongoing research. What's going on, everyone? You are listening to the Matrix BJJ podcast. My name is Paul Tokuzolu and welcome to the show. We are brought to you by Yoga for BJJ. We talk about Yoga for BJJ a lot on this show. Uh, it's helped me immensely with uh, health, flexibility, movement, rolling, being able to relax better when I'm sparring. The benefits are endless. Yoga for BJJ is offering a two-week free trial on their website. If you're interested, go to yogaforbjj.net and you will have two weeks free access to their entire video library. They have programs for everything, whether you are a yoga beginner or a veteran. If you're a beginner, they have programs like Yoga for Rocks, which will help you out even if you feel like a rock. And they also have things like Intermediate Week or Hip Week if you're a lot more advanced. Those programs are really challenging. I think you're really going to love it, and I think you'll be surprised at how much yoga helps your jujitsu. To try it out, go to yogaforbjj.net, create an account, and you won't be charged for two weeks. We are always putting out a lot of new content on our YouTube channel. If you've only ever heard the podcast and you've never seen the YouTube channel, you are missing out on half the show. We are always posting new technique videos, narrated rolling, funny stuff that we come up with, and whatever else we can rack our minds to produce. If you want to check it out, go to youtube.com dash C dash matrix show your role. Or if that's too long, just go to YouTube, type in matrix and we'll come up. You can also go to matrix.com for links to everything. If you are a saint and you really want to support the show and you love what we do, we are now on Patreon. So if you want to sign up for a monthly donation, we will send you some exclusive content in return. All of the details are on our Patreon page. So if you're interested, go to matrix.com and you can sign up to be a donor. In return, I will donate you my firstborn son whenever he's born. First person to sign up as a donor gets uh, two firstborn sons. My guest today is Croiler Gracie. Croiler is the grandson of Elio Gracie, and like many other Gracies you may have heard of, he grew up teaching and training in this art that we all love so much. Croiler shared a lot of information on this episode, and I don't want to waste any more of your time having to listen to little old me, so let's just get right to the interview. Please welcome Croiler Gracie. so much for doing this i really appreciate you coming on the show man yeah, thanks for having me so you own your own academy can you talk a little bit about um what that's like what, what's your day-to-day -day life kind of look like these days yeah i mean um you know i never planned on having my own academy it kind of just happened um i always wanted to train and kind of get better at it and then you know by, by the time I was 18 or 19, I was like, you know, this might be the life. <laughs> so um, I open open my own school. Um, I teach six days a week, and uh, I'm usually there, I don't know, five hours a day, six hours a day. And, uh, you know, whether it's training or teaching classes or reaching out to people, um, it's fun. It's, it's probably the best job I could have. Um, I, if I could do it for free, I would. That's awesome. Um, personally, I think that like, I think that opening academy and teaching is kind of the way to go. If you really want to make money doing jujitsu and you want to have like a really a business that you can really grow into kind of whatever you want, you could kind of have it be a huge, you know, association, or you could just have your academy and, you know, do that if you want. And it's, 
it's nice to make to be your own boss and to make your own hours you know it's it's nice to see people improving and growing you know i think i think a lot of uh, a lot of pleasure out of seeing my students progressing it better yeah. um maybe even more so than to see me get better you know mm -hmm. um because if i do well or if i train i feel like i'm doing better well i should they're my students you know yeah <laughs> um but to see them get better to see them get tougher and more uh, experienced it, it's huge um the the business side of things being able to make your own hours to take vacation when you want to take vacation um all that is 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 unlike any other job you know yeah and, and like you said it can be anything i want it to be you know yeah yeah what are um what are what were some like early challenges that you had to face when you're opening your academy that that taught you taught you some lessons well i've been uh, i've been teaching since i was like 14 um, I didn't have my own school, but I've been teaching since I was 14. Uh, my dad's a black belt. Um, I taught at his school for a long time. And, um, you know, early on in my career, the, the difficult part was uh, people not wanting to learn from somebody so young. You know, when I, like, so I was 14, 15, 16, people were like, you know, who's this kid? You know, he's nobody. And there was a lot of, like, egos that were challenging me, like, in class. And, and I think to me, that was the toughest part, you know, because you have to prove it to them that you know what you're talking about. Um, the question is, how do you go about proving it? And for a long time, I was, uh, I was a teenager, you know, for a long time, I was like, I'm just going to like the hand of God, you know, come yeah. down on you and, and show you that I'm better. And so you have to listen to me. And then I turned like 17, 18. I met, uh, Marcia Stambowski. Uh, who is an incredible uh, eighth degree black belt now. And uh, I, I learned a lot from him and it, it changed my view on how to get people's uh, respect, especially when you're younger than they are. Um, I, I simply just decided to show them, to, to have them try it my way. And then when they figured out that doing things the way I was telling them to do, um, the techniques that I was trying to pass them when they were trying them, and they were seeing how much easier it was working. Um, all of a sudden, they were like, "Okay, you really do know your stuff. You're not just a tough kid, you know." Um, so, to me, that was the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, the business side of it. If you do something you love, money comes. You know, the the financials align up, the opportunities show up. So, uh, that was that was never uh, an issue for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, that that makes a lot of sense. You know how uh. How do you usually like to st structure your classes so that you're teaching um, teaching the techniques in a way that people are going to be able to implement? You know what I mean? Um, so I I don't know anybody else that teaches quite like I do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very analytical person. Um, I, I have a, a biology and chemistry background, so I'm oh, very, cool. very structured on how things should be. I actually um, write out my classes months ahead of time. So, um, I actually have a structure. I even know what they're going to ask me. Like I type out, like, what, what would I ask if I was learning this for myself? You know, and then I type out responses yeah. and I study them. Um, so the way I structure my classes, every technique we spend, essentially we spend a week with the technique and then next week I'm like, okay, so what issues have you guys come up with? And then every issue that they come up with, we counter it or, or, you know, nullify it somehow in the following weeks. And it just goes on forever. Um, to give you an idea, we just finished uh, the closed guard. We're working on closed guard for like three and a half years. We never ventured outside of it for my advanced students. And it was just technique after technique after technique. And yeah. it, they're, like I said, it just flows very well together because I answer all the questions that come up. And, and if a student asks me something that I haven't found a solution for or haven't encountered before, um, then that's great. Then we all sit down as a class and we troubleshoot it, right? So like, how should we deal with this? And uh, we find solutions. So I, I feel like because every every question that they have, there is another technique to follow it up, to answer it, to solve that issue. They, um, they, they pick it up, they learn it, they implement it very well. You know, I've, uh, I've heard of a lot of people using this technique very very uh, successfully where you teach with a theme you know where it's like okay this is 
the close guard month or the close guard week or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to teach. And um, I've found that that works really well, like to teach techniques. But furthermore, I've also found I don't really even like it anymore if I go to an academy that doesn't teach that way. You know, like whenever I go to an academy and they're just like, oh, no, we just show up and, you know, teach whatever we want that day. And it's only like a that day has one theme, but then the next day is t- something totally different. I feel like, like, man, this is like a waste of time, you know, almost like, no, you're not going to remember this. Yeah. I mean, I look at when I, like growing up learning techniques, um, everybody that I trained with or under um, throughout my career um, up until very recently, um, everybody teaches, like you said, what they feel like that day. Yeah. You know, yeah. So if they feel like, oh, I'm going to do arm bars today, then they do arm bars today. And tomorrow it might be like chokes from the back, you know? Yeah. And I think that's where people struggle to learn because there is no cohesion. There's no um, flow to it. And you, every once in a while you'll get these guys that are very talented, very skilled. They pick it up, they can put it together. But, yeah. you know, the vast majority of people can't do that. Yeah. And I think that's a that's a weakness in jiu-jitsu and the jiu-jitsu community and how they teach Um but, you know, they kind of have to figure out, as a teacher, as an instructor, you have to figure out what's the best way for my students to learn. And, and I, like I said, I, I found this to be very successful. It works very well for me. Um, my seminars are the same way. When I teach a seminar, I ask, okay, what do you want to work on? They give me whatever, you know, a technique, a move, a topic. And then I'm like, all right. And then we just build from that point forward. Yeah. Um, I think people remember better that way as well. Yeah. And you're, you're meeting their needs, so to speak. You know, you're saying, Hey, what's your problem? Tell me anything and I'll help you out. You know, I think that that, uh, it's almost like that's how you would teach a private lesson one-on-one in a lot of ways. But now you're applying that same methodology to a larger group, which is, that's awesome. Correct. And it doesn't leave anybody behind. Yeah. You know, the people that may not be as talented or as athletic, you know, they're going to take a little longer to learn technique. Um, and I think the cohesion makes it easier for them instead of catering to the highest, you know, the best student class. Yeah. This way you kind of hit everybody on the spectrum. Yeah. It's a really good idea. <laughs> that sounds really <laughs> effective. <laughs> well, it, it took a long time. It took a long time. And, and every, every couple of days I still type out more classes that way everything is structured. And, and sometimes I have to change those classes, you know? a new situation comes up and I'm like, okay, we got to answer this now. So I swap out the order of the classes and keep going. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's been, it's paid off for me. My students have gotten, um, much, much better. Um, I have, like I said, that we spent a lot of time in close guard. We just finished the close guard. Um, and it's funny because my students at the beginning of it, they were, they would go compete, they would get to close guard and they couldn't quite do much, you know, cause they were just learning, they were struggling. Yeah. And by the end of it, they were like getting to close guard and that was it. Like that was, they would win the match there. Just, you know, they would mount score awesome. points, they would, you know, submit. And it was really cool to see that progression. And you could tell that the other competitors, you know, close guard is kind of like old school. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you don't see a lot of that in competitions nowadays anymore. I know it's and unfortunate. You tell, the, you tell the other guys are just waiting for them to open and what they wouldn't. And then yeah. all of a sudden it was game over. <laughs> What a uh, what do you usually teach them in closed guard? Like I um my teacher for example teaches a lot of flower sweep from from closed guard and he he likes it because you don't really have to open your legs until the moment you're going to sweep. So he yeah. thinks it's very effective. Yeah, no, I do like the, the flower sweep. We did spend a lot of time with it. I think we did like a if memory serves me right, like 28 or 29 techniques off the flower. Wow. Um it's a lot. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm talking about like they're long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, That's awesome. But what I what I like to do personally, myself, um, I like to do, I do a variation off the pendulum sweep. Okay. Uh, same side sleeve, but instead of hooking the same side leg, I, I go to the far side leg. Um, personally, I like to do that. Um, as far as like teaching my students, I teach them everything. I don't, I don't hold anything back. Even if it's something that I don't personally use, yeah. I still teach it to them because it may work better for their game or their style than mine. Yeah. Uh, 
So I, I teach them everything. Like there's, I, I don't, that's well, awesome. Back, there are no secrets, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. When you were, um, when you were growing up, was the teaching kind of similar to what you described or was it a lot different? Oh no. <laughs> like the way, the way that you were trained. I, when I, when I was trained, basically you came into the school and whether it was my grandfather or my, one of my uncles or a cousin, you'd come in and they're like, okay, we're working on this today. And you're like, great. You come in tomorrow, whole different subject. You know? <laughs> and um, I, I've been blessed to have some of the best instruction growing up. Um, yeah, you know, I bet. in individual classes, they, they were incredible instructors. They, you know, no, there's no questioning that. Yeah. Um, but it took me a long time to put it back together. I will tell you that, you know, I started very early and, and I didn't get very good or where I felt good until like purple Like that's, that's when I started feeling like, okay, this is just stuff. It works. Like it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You know, um, that's how, I feel too. For me. <laughs> that's how I feel too. <laughs> I feel like, uh, I'm a, I'm a purple belt now. I feel like it's finally, I feel like I could finally like actually use this if I had to, you know what I mean? Right. Up until this point, yeah. I felt like, ah, you know, you know, thank you. I'm, people will be like, Oh, you train jujitsu. You're a badass, right? I'm like, Nope, Nope, not at all. And now I'm, I don't think that, I don't think that at all. But now I think like, I don't know, I could, I could describe to you the techniques that a badass would use. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, I found that, um, you know, when I was going through the ranks, um, as far as, like, techniques that badass would use, um, <laughs> I always thought it was, like, the flashy stuff, you know, like, seeing all these guys doing these amazing flips and jumps and yeah. twists and turns. And then the older I get, the more I realize that the badass stuff for me is what they call it, the old school. You know, you get good pressure, good control, yeah. you know, good angle, good framing. And all of a sudden you have an opponent or a training partner who just can't do anything to you. Yeah. They're, they want to do things, but they just, they just can't, Yeah, you know, to me, there's nothing more badass than throwing a sweep or a submission in slow motion and then not being able to do anything about it. Like to me, that's, that's like the best thing. Yeah. You know? They get like a five second arm bar. Yeah. And then they just can't stop it. That's, that's, uh, that's cool to hear. You know, um, a lot of one of the main things I've taken away from this podcast is a lot of guests, a lot of people have talked about like exactly what you said, how like the slower you can do something, the better, you know, like the the tighter your pressure and stuff like that, the the less space, the more or the more space you take up in everything you do, the, the better. And right. um, they used to say um, <clears throat> like it was something I only understood later. Um, they used to tell me that Hickson was the best in the family, not necessarily because his technique was better, but just because sparring with him, rolling with him, was the most uncomfortable thing in the world. You know, he could be side mounted, not doing anything, and you're miserable. And you know, and now I feel like you know what? That's the way to go. Yeah. If I don't have to do anything and you're suffering, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've uh, I've actually been trying to switch my passing game up a lot because I, I like the faster passing style. But seriously, so many people on this podcast have said like, "No pressure passing, give it a give it a try," you know. And uh, so now I'm trying to give it a try. But uh, well, still there, there is a place for everything. You yeah. know, um, I don't think any technique should be discarded or ignored. Um, as far as like the passing, the fast passing, absolutely, I do it too. You know, but when when shit hits the fan and it's, you know, for all the marbles, so to speak, then, yes, I'm sticking to pressure. I'm sticking to tightness. I'm sticking to making you miserable to achieve what I want, you know. Yeah. If I'm playing around and being more fun and relaxed, then, yeah, I'll do the, the faster ones just to create a scramble because I like the scrambling. Yeah, it's but, Like I said, when it's for real, you're suffering. <laughs> yeah. So... That's, um, that's good to hear. You know, that's, uh, what, a if, do you have any, um, how do you use that style in no gi? Cause I found it much harder to use a pressure passing style when there's no gi. Right. So no gi is, you know, 
there's no way to prevent it. No gi is, is going to be faster paced. You know, you have sweat going on. There's no uh, gi friction. So it, slow, it, it speeds things up where a gi slows things down. Um, and, and I am more fast paced without the gi. But I found that if you threaten people left and right, they slow down. Um, and, and by threaten, does not mean throwing a bunch of different submissions. Like for me, I'm, I'm a big wrist locker. Um, oh, okay. I love attacking the wrists in, in any way, shape, or form that I can get to them. Um, and they're not the conventional grab your wrist and crank. They're, they're sneakier. And what I've found is um, when people roll with me uh, in Nogi, if I can't slow them down with pressure or you know the conventional means, I start messing with their wrists. And all of a sudden, they have to think about their wrists because nobody attacks wrists. You know? In Nogi, if I'm falling behind, somebody's a little faster than me, you know, a little bit squirmy, slippery. Um, I start messing with their wrists, you know, and and all of a sudden they have to think about their wrists and they have to start defending them, which is not something that they're used to. So yeah. that slows them down. That constant threat of you know where should I put my hands? Should I put it here or over there? Um, and, and I've had people from white to black that either trained with me, visited me, or that I've gone and visited and trained with them. And they, they've told me, like, I don't even know where to put my hands. And, it, you know, if you don't know where to put your hands in a fight, you're not fighting. You're getting beat, you know? Yeah. So um, I found that with, with no gi, a little bit more pressure, a little bit more wrist control kind of slows them down for me. I'll have to try that. That uh, Do you just kind of – do you go for the wrist first or, you know what I mean? Uh, do you kind of grab it out of nowhere or do you just try to set uh, it up a little bit? I, I kind of let them – Come to me. You know, okay. what's the first thing you do in a grappling match? You, you reach out. Yeah, your yeah. hands are coming out. Yeah, and then that's it. They're coming, you know. It's like fishing, except the, the fishes are jumping on, into the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and you just pick what you want. Um, I have a whole system, a whole wrist lock system that I, 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 I use. And I use gi. I use it in no gi. I, it doesn't matter what the situation is. And it really throws people off. Thank you for that. I'm going to have to try that. Yeah, yeah, start playing with the rotational stuff. You know, don't do the whole, like, bending, you know, look for a rotation. The rotation of the wrist is more effective, I think. Yeah. That's, that's good to that's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, play with it. You know, just let me know how it works for you. I will, for sure. Um, another one thing I wanted to ask you. Earlier you said that um, your instructors you had growing up were incredible and really, really good. Um, what do you think made them so good and what uh what teaching styles have you or teaching like techniques have you learned from them so um if we're speaking about them their ability you know uh, a lot of my instructors are gracie family members right. and uh, you know there's no no better source for pure jujitsu than them um uh, by any means and and they are they they were very very effective on their own but I think the thing that made them incredible teachers is because they cared. Um, I think virtually every one of my instructors at some point decided that they no longer wanted to compete and that their focus was on others. So you could really tell that they cared for you, um, that they wanted to see you improve, that they wanted to see you get better, that um, your wins were their wins, your losses were their losses. Um, there's a very deep level of um, love, so to speak, um, between the my instructors and, and me, or even me and my students. Like when my students compete, I am a wreck. Like I'm out there and I'm like, I feel like worse. I feel like I should go out there and compete for them because <laughs> I want them to win so bad. And I don't even want the medal. I just, yeah. I'll, I'll win it for you. Take the medal. You yeah. know. Um, I, I think the the caring for your students, like truly caring for your students. And not making it about a paycheck, not making it about oh I gotta please this guy so he sticks around so I make more money, you know. Yeah. I think I, I gotta focus on on you so you get better, you know. And and if you're getting better, then you're happy. And I think focusing on on people and, and their needs and, and truly caring and compassionate to them, I think that made them incredible. As far as teaching techniques, um, on top of caring focusing on a particular student and, and their needs. You know, if you have somebody who is a freak athlete, just natural athlete, 
your approach to teaching a person should not be the same as if you're teaching somebody who was assaulted before, who was a victim of yeah. a certain case. Like you have to like, get to know your students and kind of tailor your teaching to them so that they they get what they need and they learn what they need to learn. Um, so that to me, those are two big things. Um, teaching strategy, be patient. You know, um, it's it's so so often instructors get frustrated with the specific student or or certain class behavior, and they take it out on the students. The, the point is to make them better, not to beat them down. Um, and one thing I learned from my grandfather, um, which is unique to all my all the instructors I've had, all the people I've trained with, whether they realize it or not, my grandfather was a huge fan of this. My grandfather used to call, no matter who you were, if he just met you, he's like, hey champ, every time. Like, you know, and I think my, my grandfather never said, oh, this is wrong. Like, you're doing this wrong. Fix it. Yeah. It was always like, hey man, that was really good. Try it this way though. It's a little better. Mm. You see what there? Yeah. And then never, never talk negatively towards you. It was always yeah. a positive thing. You know, mm. or, you know, the arm bar was really, really good. But if you did it this way, it would be easier. You yeah. see, so it, it makes you feel good about what you know, and it makes you want to learn more instead of like, oh man, I can't do anything right, you know. Yeah. Um, and then that's something I take to heart. I do it with all my students. I've never told any of my students this is wrong. Don't do that. Yeah. I've um, do it this way, or try this instead. You know, these things might work better for you. It might be a little easier, but never like no you were wrong because the moment you do that, you create a conflict between student and the teacher and they no longer care to listen to what you're yeah. saying. They just care to defend their point. But it works with this guy. I worked over there. Well, this way is easier. Yeah. You know? And if you create that conflict, they're not going to see your point ever. And, and I think that's where it creates rifts. That's where you have people leave the gym. That's where you have people switch teams. That's where um, people lose the respect for the instructor. I think um, we all have to understand we're in the same journey together. And the same mistakes my students will make or have made, I've made. And who am I to tell them to call them out on them making a mistake? If they knew as much as I know, they wouldn't be learning from me. You know, So I just try to show them the easier route to get to where I'm at instead of beating them down and saying this is wrong start yeah. over you know that, that doesn't help anybody yeah that's a really good philosophy i like that that's a good way to yeah. good way to teach yeah thanks thanks it's 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 it was hard at first but it's gotten so much easier now yeah and um you create such a positive atmosphere that way you absolutely know? and and not only that but they'll they'll remember what you say because they're not like, I think if you criticize first, then people's defenses kind of naturally come up and then they're just not hearing what you say as well. Right. I, I want you to want to be there. Yeah. If you don't want to be there, then then I don't want you there either, you know? Yeah. So I have to make sure that I do the best I can for you to want to be there, for you to want to learn, for you to want to help others, for you to want to improve yourself. If you're coming in there and you're like, oh man, this is a chore. I got to go in and train. You know, that that's not fun for me. That's not fun for you. That's not fun for anybody. So yeah. I try to keep my, my school as positive as possible. And, and essentially what I've created in my school is a family, you know, like we all, everybody in my school from all ages, all walks of life, we all hang out outside of the school. We always help each other out, you know? We, if somebody needs something, we're there. If, if we want to celebrate something, everybody's there celebrating. Um, and I think that's because everybody feels the love and the positive environment in the school. And I, I think that that's, some, that's something I wish all the instructors would do because there's so much negative like feelings towards each other in jujitsu. You know, certain school is better than this school or this yeah. style is better than that style. Like, come on, dude, it's all jujitsu, you know, yeah. like just different flavor. Let's just learn to learn to like everybody, learn to help everybody. You know? Yeah. I, I think that, um, 
it's so silly to have beef with one another because um, if anything, we should all have beef with like soccer or baseball or you know what I mean? Like things that like aren't as cool or golf, like things that like are taking away other people from jujitsu, you know, like baseball's boring compared to jujitsu. Yeah. Like I don't want to, like we shouldn't be uh, mad at those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I, you know, I, People are like, I'm a big guy, you know, I'm, I'm six, three, almost six, four, like 240 pounds. I'm a big dude. And no matter if I meet somebody, they see my size, like, Hey, you like football. I'm like, I couldn't tell you two teams, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I know. You know I, I just don't, it's not as interesting to me. No. Uh, the, the, the grappling arts uh, to me, that's, that's so like so much fun to watch and so interesting to watch. And, and like you said, why am I, why am I mad at this dude? He likes yeah. what I like. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, we don't have to agree on everything, but we like the same stuff. Let's get along. Yeah. We're on team combat sports up against team, uh, shitty sports that no one see, <laughs> everyone seems to like. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you know like, we're that we're the oddballs. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I think one day jujitsu is going to take over the world and we're going to be like, hey, remember back when like baseball was a thing and everyone's going to be like, oh, yeah, we're going to they're going to look back on it like how we look at, I don't know, fucking handball. Yeah, handball or something or uh, like it's boring <laughs> kickball. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, jujitsu is already everywhere. Yeah, it it's going to become more mainstream. Uh, I, I will tell you, within five or ten years, everybody will have seen jujitsu match. <clears throat> um, I have a cousin, uh, Deborah, um, who <clears throat> was in the United Emirates for like two years, I think, two or three years. Yeah. And she said it's mandatory there now. You know, there's schools in the United Emirates. All, awesome. all the kids have to learn jujitsu. That's awesome. You know. That's so you cool. know, I know countries like Japan, martial arts are integrated into the school system. In Brazil, virtually everybody trains you know, or has trained or has seen jiu-jitsu before. Um, I think it's becoming so big and so fast um, that within five or ten years, everybody that you know, that you talk to, has heard, seen, or participated in a jiu-jitsu match of yeah. one shape or another. Um, EBI is doing huge for jiu-jitsu um, with the platform. You yeah. know, The UFC kind of partnered up with them. And now you get all the UFC fans that are watching. Yeah. And the UFC know. just partnered with uh, Polaris, too, in the same way. And now the, yeah. the Polaris is going to be on Fight Pass. Yeah, imagine that. So it's awesome. even more people, you know. It's awesome. It's going to be huge. Yeah. And um, I think we're almost there in a way because, I mean, maybe maybe I, I'm just saying this because I live in, like, the jiu-jitsu world, so to speak. But uh, I feel like just about everyone – at least in America, everyone like knows someone who is obsessed with jujitsu. You know what I right. mean? Like, even if they're not into it themselves, like every time that I tell someone that I do jujitsu, they're always like, Oh yeah, I think my cousin does that. Or, Oh yeah, I think uh, I have a friend who's really into that. Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? Like everyone kind of, yeah. no one It's it's almost, it's very, very rare that someone's like, Oh, jujitsu. I've never heard of that. Usually they're always like, Oh yeah, my friend so-and-so he's like obsessed with jujitsu. I'm like, yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. I used to be the whole, ah, you do this stuff, you know, yeah. and, and now people are like, yeah, I've heard somebody, like you said, I've heard somebody does this or a friend or a friend or I've wanted to do it or seen it, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I'm in the Midwest in the United States. I'm literally like in the Midwest. So yeah. things are a little bit slower here, but I had a kid who just started class uh, like two weeks ago. He's like 20 some year year. A old kid comes in. He's like, "Hey, I want to train jujitsu." It's like, I don't care how much it costs. Like, I just want to sign up and go. And I'm like, "Cool." Like, I don't have to sell you. Yeah, that's cool. Like, you know, uh, know. how have you heard about this? He's like, "Oh, I've been following it for years." <laughs> so it's huge. I mean, like, I'm like, like you live like in you know Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean you've heard it for years? Yeah. I think because YouTube, um, you know, the UFC fight pass, the EBI, the Polaris, the flow grappling. It's becoming such a ease of access. People can see it so easily yeah. that it is becoming to that point. I think sooner rather than later, it'll become almost like a 
like like you said, like a regular sport, yeah. baseball, football, you know, it'll be huge. Yeah, and then uh, everyone's gonna just start watching it, and then, um, and then they're, the thing about it, the reason it's so cool is that you can watch you can watch baseball. But you can't, like, the very next day be like, you know, that baseball thing was really cool. I'm going to go down the street and pay this baseball coach to coach me. You, you know, you can't really you can't really do that. But with jiu-jitsu, you can. Someone could watch a match and they could be like, that jiu-jitsu thing is really cool. Hmm, let me get on Google. Oh, there's a place 10 minutes away. I'll go tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, that's or, what's so or, great. you know, if you want to get – if you want to go – play one-on-one with Michael Jordan, it's not going to happen. No. You know, in the just world, if you can call any instructor and say, hey, I want to do a private class, how much, you know, and they'll be like, oh, it's this much. And you can you can literally have a one-on-one with Michael Jordan in jiu-jitsu, you know, yeah. you find somebody, it could be anybody, I mean, yeah. any world champion, they'll always help, you know, they'll always roll, they'll always spar. Yeah. Um, I think that's just part of the jiu-jitsu community and it's super, super cool. Yeah. You got it. You just got to show up at their academy. And they'll probably roll with you, you know, like my coach went to Marcelo's Academy last September and Marcelo just was like, Hey man, let's do, uh, let's do some like Randori, you know, like some takedown sparring. He's like, Oh, okay, great. Marcelo destroyed him. (laughs) (laughs) Well, who wouldn't Marcelo destroy really? I know. know? But yeah, I mean, no other sport would that ever happen. No, You, you can't, you know, say, Hey, uh, and I'm gonna go to the Olympic swimming team and say, "Hey Phelps, do you wanna race me real quick?" Yeah. He's gonna be like, "Like get out of here, dude." You know. Even like, so, um, even like other niche sports like CrossFit, for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard Rich Froning, for example, he's like the CrossFit version of Marcelo Garcia. You know, I've heard Rich Froning's an awesome guy, but even that, you can't go to him and be like, "Hey man, want to work out together?" He's like, "No man, I've got like my own routine." You know, like. Mm-hmm. I don't think you could keep up and it's not even he's not even being mean it's just that's how the sport works he's not going to be like yeah man let's you know let's go for this run together you know like unless he's wants to take it easy that day or something but but marcelo's like yeah man let's roll that's this is what i do you know like you're you're not even like he's not even like doing you a favor that's just him training you know yeah he just loves training you know i think the just community we we all love jiu-jitsu so much um that, that allows these things to happen. And, you know, along those lines, um, you know, I have people that come over to my school to visit, whether they're passing by or they want to just come out and train with me. Or if I visit a school, if I'm doing seminars, it's cool because the moment that you say, hey, man, I do jujitsu, everybody's like, hey, you're my best friend. You yeah. know, let's hang out. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and everybody wants to, you know, everybody understands because there's such a, a love for jujitsu, such a bond there that, you know, I, I've never said, "Hey, I, I love jujitsu. Do you like jujitsu?" And they're like, "Yeah, don't want to hang out with you, though." Yeah, like, <laughs> like that's never happened. <laughs> so, um, I think that's something that's also very unique to jujitsu, and it's the same. I think it's the same reason why you can, you know, go and get a, a sparring session with these top level guys uh, very easily. Nobody snobs you. Nobody, you know, shuts you down or ignores you. No. Um, because we all love it. Yeah, and um. I mean, there's, there's whole communities now built up around that, like the Jiu Jitsu Globetrotters group. You know, they have a huge Facebook group with, um, I forget exactly how many, but a couple tens of thousands of people. And, um, oh, yeah. you can just post it, you know, you can say, Hey, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to Scotland next week. You know, this city, is there anyone there who can host me? And you'll get five people who are like, Oh, yeah, come train with me. We'll, we'll train all day and I'll take you around. You know, it's like, yep. So I've awesome. had a bunch of those guys come by. Um, I think last year I've had like 10 or 15 guys from Glowtaros come up. I'm actually part of that group on Facebook too. Oh, awesome. It's a great uh, group. Yeah. So I just watched and, and I was in Mexico um, in April and uh, I was in, I was guest instructing at a camp out there. And there's, I think there's like five guys, six guys, six black belts thing that are part of the girl club glow Trotters group. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they were instructing. They're all cool guys. Everybody I, I hang out with, talk to, they're all cool. Um, and I think you are right. The, the Globe Throtters is turning reality. You know, they're making a, a true community, but they're making it, you know, worldwide, which is really, really cool. And I think 
combine that with the exposure from the flow grappling from Polaris, from EBI, and so on. Um, like I said, five or ten years, everybody will train, will travel to train. It'll be, I, I can't wait. It's been such a huge increase of participation, even in my lifetime. Uh, I can't wait to see what happens in five or ten years. Yeah, me too. I think it's going to be, I, I, I honestly, um, I think we're still in the early days of jujitsu. You know, I think that give it another, you know, if that's five to 10 years, give it another 50 or 80 years. I think in, you know, the next generation, like our kids would look back on it and say, you know, that we were like, this is still the early time of jujitsu. And, you know, we can't even, who knows what's going to happen. It's going to be like jujitsu Super Bowl. So jujitsu has only been around for, essentially my, my grandfather's lifetime, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, it has only been around since my grand, my grandfather's lifetime. The second generation, my, you know, my uncles, my aunts, uh, some of my older cousins. So when you compare the, the one and a half lifetimes of Jiu-Jitsu versus Kung Fu or Karate or, you know, these wrestling, you yeah. know, who, and they've been around for hundreds of years. Jiu-Jitsu is still very much, you know, in its teenage years. And, and I think you are right. I think, you know, our kids um, will look back at us and say that we're old school. Yeah. Say, and they will and they will have um, they will have a better they'll have a deeper understanding of Jiu-Jitsu than we do by far. Um, and that's something that I try to tell my students. Um, Jiu-Jitsu is young. And, and it's essentially an ongoing research and the, the improvements, the adaptations, the, the modifications that I do to my jujitsu, they will learn and they will have their, their lifetime, their career in jujitsu to take that and polish it even more. You know, who, who knows, um, where jujitsu will be in 20 years and 30 years and 50 years and hundred years. Um, look, look at the leg lock game. Yeah. Um, leg, leg lock's been around since ever. There, there are pictures of, of my grandfather. You know, there's pictures of him doing heel hooks. You know, back, you know, 20 years ago. He's a badass. There, he did heel hooks in the gi. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, there are pictures of, of guys in Japan doing triangles. You know, so imagine taking all of that and look at where we are today. I mean, in the last 10 years, how much did you just gain? The leg lock game has been polished and improved on. It's incredible. Uh, that's happening not just with the leg lock game, though. That's happening with you know sweeps, with different guards, with different arm bars, with chokes. It, imagine that you know a hundred years from now. Yeah, it'll be it'll be so much smoother, and that's because the research keeps going. And I, I said I'm I feel like a little kid when I'm talking about learning jujitsu because it, it just gets me excited. You know, I, it's so I, much fun. <laughs> <laughs> it, I could talk about it all day, um, <laughs> and and it's something that I think as instructors or as practitioners, we need to understand that we will never know everything there is to know about jujitsu. Uh, there's not going to be any one person that ever knows everything there is to know about anything in jujitsu. Yeah. I, I don't think you know Darren uh, himself, who is an incredible leg lock guy, knows everything there is to know about leg locks. I don't think. Um, Marcelo Garcia knows everything there is to know about guillotines. You know, yeah. I don't think, or, or even X Garden. He popularized X Garden. I don't think he knows everything there is to know about X Guards. Um, yeah. I, I don't think uh, you know anybody will ever know everything because there's so many people looking at Jujutsu now. There are so many minds working at it. There's so many little tweaks and improvements. And the moment that we tell ourselves, oh, I, you know, I already know that armbar. I don't need to see this again, or I know that one. Like that's when that's when you become stagnant. That's when you you're no longer an effective practitioner. That's when you become obsolete. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I wonder. So if if right now you know X Guard and uh, Barambola are considered like new 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 school jujitsu, and maybe some older school people are like, ah, that new those kids these days are using these crazy techniques. I wonder what's gonna be the next like Barambola like for us. Like, what are we gonna look at? Or what am I gonna look at and say like, oh no, that's 
that's crazy. That'll never work. That, you know, lightning fast teleport, whatever well, future technique it'll, it'll is. Be, it'll be something, you know, it'll be, I mean, the, look at it this way. Um, Jiu-Jitsu goes in cycles. Okay. If you go back and you look at footage from as early as the seventies to now, it goes in cycles. So we create a problem, right? So if I fight you, you take me down, you're on top, you win. So I'm like, okay, how do I solve that? Well, I attack from the bottom, right? So I'm like, okay, how can I attack from the bottom? I use my guard. So I create this very elaborate, powerful close guard. And then I fight you again. You take me down, you get to my close guard, I win. And then you go, wait a minute, that's not cool, you know? So I'm going to take you down. I know you're going to go to close guard, and I'm going to pass, you see? And then you become this amazing guard passer, right? So then we fight again, you take me down, close guard, you pass my guard. I'm like, I'm stuck again. Yeah. So then I develop like open guard, right? And then you develop open guard passes. And then, you, you know, we go through all these guards and eventually get to side mount. And then I have to find a way out of side mount. And, and I think that everything goes into cycles. We're getting to a point now where everybody does burn rollers. Everybody does the, the 50-50s. Everybody does the inverted guards. But how do you shut that down, right? Um, how do you prevent that from happening? I think whatever solution we come up with, we'll beat that. So for now in Nogi, leg locks are the way to go. You go open guard and leg locker. He's going to take your legs, you know? Yeah. You, so how, how, do the, how, how would you beat a leg locker in Nogi if you're going to do, you know, if you're going to fight him and you're, you're a bottom guy or whatever? You get close guard. You know, can't attack your legs, or you do what Felipe Bena did when he fought Gordon Ryan, which is a very, very good match. Um, both guys are very, very tough, and uh, Felipe Bena essentially did the oldest, old school thing in the world. He just kept pressure. Yeah, he made sure that Gordon couldn't move. Which, for a leg locker, you want that movement so you can catch those legs that are moving. You know, yeah. and so then you go back to the cycle to the beginning. So now Pena is doing old school, you know pressure passing yeah and and then the next thing is going to be how do we beat that right and it just goes into cycles and i think every cycle every full circle that we do in jiu-jitsu the circle gets bigger because yeah. the techniques get added in and you know that's a it's so, a great way to look at it yeah i i i'm stoked every day i come into training so i can find a new tweak or a new improvement or 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 encounter a new difficulty yeah you know, that's how i get better Croyler, i know you've got to head out um is there anything that you want to promote or talk about before you uh before we end this um as far as promoting um i am sponsored through phalanx um fc and and if you guys for no gay stuff phalanx is probably the best company in the world uh, their stuff is super comfortable and high quality as far as um you know, less words. Um, when you go to train jujitsu, you know, for whatever reason you started, don't ever forget why you're there and why you need to continue to be there because the the study never ends. You know, and you need to continue um, getting better and better, and not just for yourself but for your teammates too. The better you get, the better they get. And the better they get, the better you all get, you know. So um, let's continue uh, researching Jiu-Jitsu together. Proiler, thank you so much for being on the show. I really learned a lot and um, I think you have a really good perspective. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Thank you so much to everyone for listening to the show. And of course, thank you to Yoga for BJJ for sponsoring this episode. To try out their two-week free trial, go to yogaforbjj.net, create an account, and you won't be charged anything for two weeks. That's enough time for you to do at least two of their weekly programs. So you could try out the Startup Week and Yoga for Rocks if you're a beginner, or if you're a little more advanced, try Hip Week and Intermediate Week, and you will find yourself shaking. Yoga has helped me immensely, and I think you're going to be surprised with how much it changes your jiu-jitsu and your life. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this show on iTunes and Stitcher so you never miss an episode. Also, if you want to help us out, please leave a five-star rating and a review. That will ensure that more people hear this show and are, and are introduced to the messages that we share on this podcast. If you really want to support the show and you're a saint from heaven, 
we just started a Patreon page. So if you're interested, go to matrix.com and click on the link to our Patreon page. If you sign up for a monthly donation, we will send you everything we can think of. We'll send you some exclusive content. We'll send you uh, stuff that no one else is hearing, even if that's just me and Andreas like making fart noises like whatever we can think of we're gonna send it your way in the intro i promised my firstborn son and if you've made it this far and you're listening right now i'll give you my firstborn daughter as well just um just type in the coupon code firstborn daughter and you can have her it's no problem i'll send it right over as always we are producing more and more content on our youtube channel if you want if you want to see all the narrated roles and technique videos that we're doing go to youtube.com dash c dash matrix show your role and i know that link is a mouthful so you can also just go to matrix.com and all the links are right there or go to youtube type matrix and we'll come up thanks as always to our music producers that make this podcast more interesting Thanks to Vinny Russo for doing all of the beats that you hear in this show. And thanks to Waves Overhead for doing the, uh, the theme song. That's what it's called. It's called theme song. If you want to hear more of their music, go to Matrix.com and we have links to everything. You can go to their respective SoundCloud or Bandcamp pages, download their music, and give them a donation if you feel led by the spirit. The song To Make Amends by Waves Overhead is the official theme song of the podcast. You heard a little bit at the beginning, and I'm going to play the rest right now.